The heartbeat bill becomes law and faces a court fight. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Jesse Balmert, State House reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer. Jim Siegel, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Herb Asher, OSU political scientist, and Mary Ann Sharkey, public affairs consultant. After years of trying, after failed attempts, after two vetoes by Governor Kasich, the so-called heartbeat anti-abortion bill has become Ohio law. This week, the House and Senate gave final approval to the bill, which bans abortion once an ultrasound can detect a fetal heartbeat as early as six weeks into a pregnancy. Under the bill, doctors who break the law face a felony conviction, a fine, and up to a year in prison. They also risk their medical license and another $20,000 fine, which would go to adoption and foster care services. There is an exception for the mother's health, but no exceptions for rape or incest. Governor DeWine has signed it now. It looks like it is up to the courts. Jesse Balmer, advocates are saying this is the most strict or the toughest anti-abortion law in the country. Is it? Well, it would certainly restrict abortion earlier than Ohio and many other states have before. There have been, I think, five other states that have signed similar legislation into law where it bans a fetal heartbeat as bans abortion after a fetal heartbeat is detected. Uh, Georgia, there's one sitting on the governor's desk right now, and there's 11 other states that are looking at this type of legislation. So what started in Ohio is really, you know, built up a lot of momentum nationally. And so, yeah, it's, uh, but it has been challenged in court yeah. in other states and has not actually taken effect anywhere to date. And Jim, advocates on the other side are already preparing court briefs, may have already filed them by the time we go on the air. Yeah, I think uh, Iowa, Kentucky, Arkansas, North Dakota, the courts immediately put a, put a stop to these laws before they can even take effect. Uh, the expectation is, is that'll happen here in Ohio as well. The question is what happens to it after that? Um, the expectation is that these some of these are going to make their way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and that, is, of course, is the ultimate goal for uh, for the supporters of this bill. They want to see this in front of the uh, the new court uh, with uh, with President Trump's um, one or two or more, you know, who knows how many appointees by then. At least two right now. Yeah, maybe more by the, you know, by the time it gets there. And so they, they think they have a better shot now than they have in the past, uh, regardless of what the court has ruled before. And and again, they keep tying this, they, they keep trying to inch it back. Uh, it was 23, 23 um, months or 23 weeks at viability, then it moved to 20 weeks. They said it was a pain threshold for the fetus, although that, that is in dispute. Uh, now they're backing it up to the heartbeat. Uh, and they're, you know, it's where, where's the court going to allow it? Yeah. Marianne, what's changed is Governor DeWine is in office, Governor right. Kasich vetoed this, and right. the court, because the, you know, Ohio Right to Life was neutral, but also opposing this bill right. before there was a switch on the Supreme Court. Well, I mean, this is tantamount to a ban on abortion. This is as close as you can get to a, to a I mean, rape and incest. I mean, I, just about every reasonable person out there would agree that there should be exceptions for rape and incest. I think that's where this law is going to really be in trouble, is the fact that it did not make those kinds of exceptions. Also, I mean, it, it punishes these doctors. I mean, and, and it has this convoluted language that the doctors are supposed to read to a woman if, if she gets a, an abortion, which I've read it three times, I still don't understand what it says. So I don't understand how some woman is going to be able to understand what, you know, these doctors are going to be reading to them. Yeah. Yeah, some of the opposition to the bill came from representatives of the Jewish community. And they were making actually a religious argument that in Judaism, if there is a situation in which it's the health or life of the mother, and nobody quite knows what this exception really means yeah, here, that in fact in Judaism, you, if in those rare cases, you choose for the mother because right. the mother is the center of the Jewish family. And so I think you're going to see some people do friend of the court brief saying this is actually an intrusion upon our religious values if in fact that exception is, you know, because somebody has described it only in an emergency for the life of the mother at an extreme case. That's not really an exception then. And so I think you're right. going to see people concerned about that also. But they have been emboldened by this new court. You're, yeah. co yeah, you're correct yeah, yeah. about and, that. And you saw that passion. We've, you know, there have been very passionate demonstrations of support and opposition to these laws at the State House in the past. But this week it seemed like 
it was ramped up a bit, Jesse. Is that because this, they, they knew it was going to pass this time, that the governor was going to sign it in with a new court? The whole backdrop has changed. Yeah, I think so. There was a lot of focus on this bill. It was kind of the last stage where people could have their voice heard, per se, on this proposal. So I was in the House uh, session, and you could hear the protesters through the walls, um, you know, those who were who were saying, you know, stop the bans. And then there was another group out there who were praying or chanting things like Jesus. So it was a very, it's a very heightened um, people have very strong feelings about this topic, really, no matter who you are. And so it really does engender that kind of activism that maybe a lot of other bills at the Ohio General Assembly don't. Mm. Jim, is there any political fallout for lawmakers? I mean, it's early in their term, so it's, you've got almost two years now before they're on the ballot again. Will this mobilize abortion rights supporters to vote against lawmakers who voted for this? The, the latest poll shows Ohio was pretty much down the middle, supporting and opposing this this measure, the heartbeat measure? Well, traditionally, uh, it's the uh, abortion rights opponents who are much more, you know, you know it, it drives their vote yeah. much more than it does the other way. It just does, and it has for years. And But this could be, you know, there is a, there is has to be some concern, at least, that this could be an awakening uh, on the left uh, that, that, look, this is the kind of thing that, that happens when we continue to not do enough to elect, you know, Democrats who who support abortion rights, so so yeah, it there there I don't know how many actual like in the House, for example, I don't know how many actual seats could be lost because of this because the districts are gerrymandered. Because yes, uh, and frankly, some of them like you know one of the targeted seats is going to be uh, Senator Stephanie Kunze here in Franklin County. She voted against it, mm -hmm. so you know there are some who who would be targeted who didn't vote for it, uh, so. I, no, I noticed some Republicans too in no Northeast Ohio, Northwest Ohio, also yep, voted thing. voted against it. Yeah, I would say if you look at the Republicans, the few Republicans who did vote against this proposal, a lot of them are in suburban districts that are very competitive. Now, I don't want to say they didn't vote their heart on this topic, but I think it is politically. But, yeah, know. and their constituents, you could probably argue, are more divided than say in a rural district where you might be more more opposed to abortion. Well, and the rape and incest issue did, did resonate with some of these members. I know there was at least one or two Republicans that I can think of that voted no because there was no rape and incest exception to this and they, they just weren't going to go that far. Herb, what about this argument that this hurts Ohio's image as a progressive state and that'll, as a result, hurt our economy, dissuade people from living here, cause people to move, dissuade companies from locating here. Is there any merit to that? Well, maybe at the margins there is, but a lot of other states are actually moving in the same direction on this kind of legislation. And there are other issues out there, including the Ohio Fairness Act, that actually might be a more significant one for businesses. This is really the whole question of uh, protection of the LGBT community with respect to employment and housing discrimination, where in fact 600 businesses have signed up in favor of the Ohio Fairness Act. So there are a lot of things out there, and people on both sides will always want to use the argument, this will hurt the economy if you pass it, this will, this will help the economy if you do. I think the interesting thing here is that if abortion now, no matter what you thought about the issue, if abortion's off the table, pretty much for the rest of this General Assembly, and if they get the worst of the gun issues off the table, just imagine, we could have in maybe 18 months in which they could devote their energy to public policy issues, education, environment, water quality, without having these issues, which may not be as set, they're, they're very important to certain people's moral compasses and values, but they're not the issues that can, can determine the future of Ohio. It seems like these issues never go away. There's always one other regulation you could peel away, you could... Well, they try to gin up their base. I mean, that's the thing. They go farther and farther and farther as, as they gin up their base. They keep looking for another thing yeah. that'll I mean, they get may, their base out They may be disappointed that they got it done too... abortion, do it. They got it done too early. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> <not> right. <laughs> it's definitely political, yeah. 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 Bring out the base and raise money. Raise money. Don't, Don't forget yes, about the money. money. Fundraising yeah. emails. Yeah. Yeah. Any idea, real quickly, how long it would take? Has there been any projections how long, if the Supreme Court does take this up, how long it takes to get there and how long before it's decided. Any idea? Two years? I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be months, years. Year, yeah. months, if not years. So, Several years at least. Yeah. We'll be talking about this topic for yeah. quite some yeah. time to come. And there's several yeah. states, as I mentioned, in front of the Ohio already, which actually yeah. was one of the arguments made on the floor yesterday is 
why don't we? Why are the Ohio taxpayers going to have to foot the bill yeah. for this lawsuit when other states are fighting it, it already? Why don't we just wait till they're done? It could get to the Supreme Court more quickly if you have opposite decisions in different appeals courts throughout the country, Correct. and then that provides a rationale for the Supreme Court to step in. All right. Our next topic, it's really only a matter of time before Ohio lawmakers and possibly voters will have to decide on whether to allow sports betting in the state. Seven states now allow legal betting on sports, including two bordering Ohio, Pennsylvania and West Virginia. This week, lawmakers introduced a bipartisan bill in the House to legalize sports bets at casinos, racinos, and also vets and fraternal halls. That joins a similar bill in the state Senate. Jim Siegel, two bills in the legislature, the lawmakers dragged their feet on legalizing casinos, and it cost them because the casinos wrote the rules. Will they make that mistake again, or will they let this sit for a while? I don't think they're going to let it sit, but it's still not yet under, understood how they're going to work it out. Um, the House bill wants to put this into the Ohio Lottery Commission and let the lottery run this. And by doing that, not only would it go to <coughs> excuse me, some of the groups you mentioned, but it also kind of leaves open the idea of, well, if the courts and the federal government figure out online and mobile device betting, well, this, this could suddenly pop up all over the place. It, it could really expand into a lot, lot, of, lot of different areas. So uh, the, the Senate is right now looking at a little more restrictive. They want it to go to the Casino Control Commission and pretty much limited it to racinos and casinos. Um, they're, the two sides are going to have to fight this out. And there's not only a lot of, you know, there's not only money uh, to fight over about how much, you know, 30 million or so the, in revenue to the state, each year, but there's also the, you know, who's who's on whose side in terms of, you know, the casinos and racinos would like it in the Casino Control Commission so that, so that they control a lot of the the gaming, the, you know, the, you've got the retail merchants, you've got others, um, including Intralot and others who run the lottery games now, they want it over there. So, <laughs> and, and these groups give a lot of money yeah. uh, to our politicians, not that that ever is a factor uh, in the legislature, yeah. but it, you know, it, it, it could happen. This is deja vu all over again. This is what we, we went through this with the casinos for how many years? Ten years? Yeah. Well, at yeah. least. Yeah. <laughs> About 20 it years. It failed several casinos. times. Right. You know, one of the questions, I don't think we have a good sense of this, is how much money is there really out there? Now, if you expand it to all devices and all ways of gambling, but right now I'm not sure people are saying that the experiences in other states, that there's really this windfall. No, the projections of... So the extra revenue is below projections. Yeah, yeah. About 300 so million is yeah. what they're saying. Yeah, yeah, and so... And the casino yeah. projections were far greater than the actual revenue that came in. Yeah. Ohio. Well, that's because it also didn't include the casinos at yeah. the time. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. at that time, it was just going to be four casinos. So um, that's often missed when uh, yeah. people talk about that. But so, it's interesting what you said, that it's a bipartisan bill introduced in the House. So said it too, the, the Democrat yeah, Republican. But, I mean, but the notion here that you know we're hearing bipartisan bills being introduced, that's actually reflecting, I think, uh, the leadership style of Larry Householder. Yeah, and I don't think this is a partisan issue. I just yeah. I think no. there's some more there, there's more philosophical and like who's what team are you on? Team lottery or team casino? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where, you, where you think this should yeah. go? Um, no, but I don't I don't see it breaking down <laughs> D, right. D and R though. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's I a don't... full employment for the lobbyists now. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. a lot of money in here, and there's a lot of people who want uh, yeah. want this. Yeah. yeah, I don't think there's a large <laughs> team of people saying let's not have this in Ohio at all. So you've at least gotten over that hump. But well, where issues. this money goes is going to be a problem. Even Lieutenant Governor John Husted suggested, you know, let's give it to to children who are going into sports and dance and pay that have to pay for those types of activities. So there's a lot of ideas on where this money can go. Spending the money will not be a problem, no matter what. <laughs> no. Well, if it goes to the lottery, it goes to schools, right? Yep. By, it does. By law. Yes. yes. Well, but if it goes to casinos, it goes to local government. So, it, right. you know, pick pick your poison. But I'll just um, say, <laughs> yeah. I mean, thir it's, like yeah. I said, if, we, it's, if it's 30 million a year, the lottery right now puts about a billion a year into schools. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of, that's what we're talking about here. It's not a huge chunk of, yeah. exactly. chunk of money. Exactly. The big issue is it's this to pass constitutional muster because you know the Ohio Constitution requires it be a game of chance is sports betting really a game of chance or you know you can be a very knowledgeable person and know a lot about sports and uh, make you know make you know good money off of sports betting I know a couple of people actually do that well that's one of, one of the arguments <laughs> for the Lottery Commission doing this is that they think that the Casino Commission does not have the ability under the law or the Constitution to take on this kind of gambling right. what are states having at her about that 
like West Virginia and Pennsylvania already have it because yeah. they're both next to New <laughs> Jersey, which yeah. had it right away. And so. that's also one of the arguments about we need to get into this because it's you know other states have these opportunities. It's going to take money away from us. But I think I think we're all saying here that this is not going to be a great windfall, no matter who's running it or you know who gets you know who gets the benefits or whatever. But I think people will be afraid that uh, you know that some people will be asking. Who lost sports betting? Why doesn't Ohio have sports betting? And that's not exactly a great reason to have it, but I think you're right that you know we're past that point. A lot of people are saying we're going to have it, so now the details are right. who, who's going to benefit, who's going to profit, who's going to run it. I, I would imagine that you know Ohio State University and the other schools in the University of Cincinnati, Dayton, they're not too excited about this. Is there any chance it gets limited to pro sports? You can bet on pro sports. You can bet on the Columbus Clippers, but you can't bet on... Ohio State. You can bet on the Indians or the Blue Jackets. Any, any talk of that? Any chance of that? Or, uh, or I don't know if there's sports. talk of it. Yeah. I would be surprised um, that if it did get limited to that yeah. because there is so much betting that goes on in college sports right yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot more than I think would be bet on the Clippers. I'm not sure I'd put any bets on the Clippers. <laughs> <laughs> we just finished the biggest betting event of all, you know, uh, March Madness. Well, March Madness, right. Right. Yeah. But years ago, Ohio State, when there was some talk about this, Ohio State was very, very worried about sports gambling and well, that somehow it would contaminate the integrity of whatever. Well, that's an issue. I mean, you know, yeah. point, point shaving. Point shaving. Yeah, yeah. Around. Yeah, those, those did happen. Yes, that. they did. All right, and perhaps one of the shortest campaigns on record, the effort to change how Ohio casts its electoral votes for president has ended. It lasted about a week. The plan was to ask voters to change the Ohio Constitution to mandate all of the state's electoral votes be cast for the presidential candidate who won the national popular vote, even if that candidate did not win Ohio. So, in 2016, Ohio's votes would have gone to Hillary Clinton even though Donald Trump beat her by a half million votes. It's an effort to ensure the winner of the national popular vote wins the White House, something that didn't happen in 2016. The group behind the effort says it doesn't have the money or the time to collect the signatures to get it on November's ballot. Herb? Or the support. Is that what it was? <laughs> was it money or time, or was it support? All, all of the above. And, and, and if you really are a part of a group that wants to make the Electoral College irrelevant, then you should really be supporting a national constitutional amendment that says the winner of the national popular vote, in fact, wins the election. And basically, that's abolishing the Electoral College. But there are a lot of people who want to achieve the outcome of the popular vote winner, but somehow want to preserve the Electoral College because they're worried it's too heavy a lift if you try to get rid of the sacred Electoral College. So there are a lot of other th proposals out there. You know, states can choose how to allocate their Electoral College votes so that, in fact, uh, they can allocate them by a congressional, congressional district, district. Yeah. and a few, two states do that or whatever. But, but this one I thought was an idea whose time had not come and would probably never come. And, uh, but, you know, thinking about it, if you're a Democrat, if you had this amendment in your constitution in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Ohio in 2016, Clinton would have been the, uh, the victor. But uh, I, I don't think that's the direction. If you want electoral college reform, think about how do you actually achieve a popular vote winner becoming president and don't start messing around with the Electoral College. There's no, no, there's no groundswell of support, even though we've had a few elections in the past you know, two decades where the national popular vote winner didn't win. Yeah. Well, this was also kind of an odd effort. It wasn't really clear who was behind it. We had you know, the person who submitted the, you know, the information to the Attorney General's office, but the national group that has been backing efforts like this came out and said, hey, we're not involved in this. And so I think that was going to be a problem going forward, regardless yeah. of the content of this proposal. It was already kind of shaping up to be a, a poorly run affair. It, it would have ended up making Ohio irrelevant. I mean, you know, if you had to go according to the <laughs> national vote, then who's going to come into Ohio to campaign? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just was I mean, the biggest loser would be the Ohio's TV stations, who <laughs> yes, yeah, raking yeah, yeah. millions well, most uh, of the TV on ads. Stations. <laughs> yes, right. And, well, not, not us. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> well, I, mean, I would say, I mean, there are a lot of, this is a, actually, a, to me at least, a fascinating debate about whether we should continue the Electoral College or not. I mean, right now, the, you know, some say, well, if you don't, if you don't have the electoral college, then states are going. Some states will just be forgotten about that. That is, and not just not really Ohio, but others. Well, currently, the they, the candidates only visit 17 states right now. Yeah, 33 New York and California. Never, 33 states never see a candidate almost mm -hmm. ever, and so this there is an argument to be made. This actually could open it up more. People, you know, and and to places like California and Texas, because running up the score more 
in a red state or a blue state would mean more now yeah. than it yeah. does currently. And and so it it is a, to me it is a fascinating debate about why you know whether we continue to do this or not. I mean, Mike Dewine called it a, a stupid idea uh, when asked about it this week, and he said, "Why would Ohio voters want to want to uh, give up their right to make decisions about the president?" Well, if you're an Ohioan who voted for Hillary Clinton who won the popular vote, you could make an argument you yeah. did give up your yeah. vote but, to. But, yeah, but this proposal was simply for Ohio, state right, constitution, exactly. right. did not have any implications you know, across the other states. I mean, if we, well, if, they were hoping if, to get a bunch of states to do the same thing, so in essence, yeah. the electoral well, college I mean, would be... He's, but, he's got a good point yeah, that yeah. the electoral college is a good issue to debate, yeah. but yeah. this yeah. was the wrong proposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How about the Absolutely. primary system? We have... 18 official Democrats running for president. Oh, gosh. We, I mean, that's, talk about a system that might where, need a little bit of tweaking. Oh, well, I know. Where, where this are, is like the voice editions, where, where are the party, <laughs> please, the party please, bosses? Please, they don't exist. Yeah. 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 We, yeah. We've all become reality yeah. TV. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're all trying out for, you know, to, be, to work on CNN as commentators. And you and saw now that the, sell uh, books and one <laughs> of the qualifications for making the debates is you have to have 65,000 individual contributions. <laughs> and so uh, Kirsten Gillibrand is on TV with ads saying, uh, and on line, please send me a dollar. I need that account toward the 65,000 <laughs> right. individual contributions. You know, they're trying to find out. You know, you have these debates. If you have them with 20 people, they're meaningless in many ways. Yeah. So you want to have viable candidates. Both, But if you use viability defined by your percentage in the polls, that's kind of a... And then somebody a, like Trump wins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. With 17 yeah. candidates on the yeah. stage. All right. Believe it or not, a lot of Ohioans still get their power from nuclear <laughs> energy. Coal and natural gas generate most of our electricity, but nuclear plants generate 15% of our electricity. But those plants are getting old, and they have a hard time competing with cheaper natural gas. That's why First Energy wants lawmakers to approve putting a surcharge on Ohio's electricity bills to subsidize the Perry and the Davis-Bessey nuke plants in northern Ohio. Opponents call it a bailout that would hamper efforts to boost renewable energy. Supporters say the charge is a small price to pay for to support hundreds of jobs and generate power without carbon emissions. Mary Ann Sharkey, you're from the Cleveland area. Yeah. You're closer to these plants. Yes, I am. <laughs> so a lot more of your electricity up there comes from these plants. What's the feeling up there? Well, I think, you know, a lot of people have mixed feelings because there's a lot of jobs, you know, with, with these plants. And, um, you know, it's, they are clean energy. So people who are involved in the clean energy movement like it. But no, I'll be honest with you, very few people in Northeast or Ohio trust First Energy. Um, they just are not, have not, you know, kept their word on very much. They announced the closure of these plants three days before they file, filed for bankruptcy. Um, I mean, you don't, you never, I, I, I'm totally against it. I think it's a non-starter that people who live in Pike County are going to pay 250 a month on their electric bill to, you know, take care of the, you know, the, the plant, nuclear plants up in the northeast and northwest Ohio. I just there, don't think it's going to happen. There is a move to perhaps eliminate some other surcharges to make it a wash for ratepayers, but yeah. still it's, it's they, propping up these plants. Yeah, that's right. And so it's, it's really, in a sense, uh, uh, a corporate bailout. Right. And First Energy, as you said, as Marion said, <clears throat> has not had a good reputation over the years. But, uh, but and some people are arguing that even though they're not the most reputable of firms or over the years their track record in terms of keeping their word isn't great, there still are good public policy reasons for keeping these two plants running. Exactly. And, uh, and so I think, you know, I think the legislature is going to have an interesting challenge here. How do you balance this? You know, some people raise the issue, why should somebody in, in Portsmouth who has, let's say, a, a very small income mm -hmm. have to pay 250 a month while somebody here in a suburb in Columbus has to pay 250 is, is, is that fair? So there's going to be a lot of issues of fairness here. And, uh, but the public, there are some public policy arguments as to why they should preserve these plants. Yeah, you have a diverse, if you maintain a diverse but, group of power yeah. generated plants. But the other thing, you know, you know when they claim that they're, you know, they're, they don't impact the carbon you know, footprint or whatever, uh, wait till you shut them down at some point and ask the question, Who's going to take care of the disposal of the nuclear yeah. waste? And well, that's going to no be. There's no place to dispose. That's right. That's right. Keep it's it going to be a multi-billion. It takes 60 years. They, yes. they say to yeah, yeah, yeah. close one of these plants. You got to keep the stuff on site until they find <clears throat> another place to put yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, time for our final off-the-record parting shots. Marianne Sharkey, you're up first. I think LeBron James is sorry that he signed a four-year contract with the Lakers. I'm guessing by now he feels like it should have just been one year and he'd had an opportunity to bail out of this situation. 
I don't know. The weather in L.A. is probably better than Cleveland was. <laughs> this winter, anyway. Herb. Uh, I think both uh, Speaker Householder and Speaker Pelosi have demonstrated in some of their recent comments that less is more. And credit to them. For Pelosi the other day in commenting about the Attorney General basically said, uh, I'm disappointed in his comments. I think he's gone off the rails. And, and when her members were going crazy about impeachment, she simply said, uh, it's not worth the talking about. It. The president's not worth it. And then Householder, you know, the other day, you know, when asked about abortion, said, look, is that going to hurt your bipartisan process? We disagree on these issues, but we'll, we'll agree on a lot of other. You know, he just handled it beautifully. And then, of course, his binky comment was also one. Yeah. Jim. Uh, something we haven't talked about since it was passed probably about a dozen years ago is there's, there is a spending limitation on the Ohio budget and what you're allowed to increase in spending each year. And we're bumping up, not only bumping up against it, we're, I'm being told we probably have gone over it at this point because of the transfer of money in the transportation budget over to, to transit. And it's going to have to be dealt with. Uh, I'm not saying it can't be dealt with. And I, uh, Larry Householder, when asked about it this week, said, don't worry, we'll handle it. But it is something that they're going to have to pay attention to and something they haven't really thought, had to think too much about uh, for the last decade. And Jesse. It's been a serious week in the Ohio legislature, so I just want to draw attention to fabulous photos of video videographers who are forced to wear ties in the Ohio Senate. Some of them are quite tiny, <laughs> and it's the just great are. fun. Yes. Yeah. The photographers are yeah. good size. The, the ties are tiny. The ties are a little, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mike DeWine had a great photo op this week, showing he's more accessible as a governor than his, his previous, the previous governor. Had a picture with Clifford the Big Red Dog this week I saw on Twitter. So. Good for the governor. That's Columbus on the record. We'll see you next week. Have a good one.